everybody and welcome to geopolitical trends where truth matters very excited to be with you because i have an interesting guest for you and i'm not gonna waste too much time because my guest is on limited time so i'm gonna get into it right away so let me bring in john in here hi john hey how are you david good to talk to you thank you very much for being here and carving out time i know Thanks how busy you are and and we know we know so my my uh my viewers are very excited to have you here because they're, they're going to be hearing from your perspective. So, uh, you guys, just regarding John Kriako's bio, I put the entire the full bio in the description along with the titles of his books. So, just for me briefly to give you a heads up, just for you to know who John Kriako is, he's an American author, journalist, and a former CIA intelligence. He was also working in the Senate uh, Foreign Relations Committee in yep. Congress. So, and uh, he is the the uh, host of the Political Misfit, along with Michelle. Which, by the way, I'm going to bring in Michelle next time. So, uh, FYI, guys, John speaks Arabic. So, that's just for you to know. What that's, and, that's Kalamari. Yeah, marhaban big, habibi, marhaban big. <laughs> so, and some of his books, guys. Here is the latest book here, The Reluctant Spy. You want more? You might want to check it out. I have also another picture of these one of the books here the when the like of the when time like a spy so you might want to guys take a look at uh, john's books you will learn a lot because you don't become a cia analyst just out of the whim of those are years and years and years of experience yeah well speaking of that john i'm gonna get into it right away given your professional background as a, as a former cia analyst as also one who is dealing with the foreign relations committee and so forth where do you see the stage of the global order, given the chaos that's going on? What are we looking at? Oh, I think we are looking at uh, the beginning of a permanent multipolar world. You know, we had this period from the fall of the Soviet Union mm -hmm. until, uh, you know, until recently, until the last few years, where it really was unipolar with the Chinese making uh, some some moves to the to the front of the line. But I think now we really do have a unipolar world. And I, I mean, a, a multipolar a world. Multipolar. And, yeah. Yeah. And, and it, it didn't necessarily have to be from the American perspective, but we made some strategic errors, I think. We, uh, we pulled out of the JCPOA, for example. That was a mistake. Uh, rather than to, uh, to work constructively with the Chinese, we decided to, well, President Obama decided to pivot to Asia that was meant to challenge the Chinese. And, uh, you know, there were so many areas, David, where we could have cooperated with the Russians. It, it could have been counterterrorism, counter narcotics, counter proliferation, all different, different areas. And we elected instead to, uh, to challenge the Russians. Now the Russians are not as economically strong, uh, of course, as the Chinese, they don't have, uh, they don't have the, the kind of population that the Chinese do that will fuel economic growth. But really, there are three main powers in the world right now, and um, and uh, this is something I think we're going to have to get used to. Wow. Well, speaking of JCPOA, I, as one who wrote a book about uh, Iran uh, back then, I tell the volatile state Iran in the nuclear age, and I did address this issue of the JCPOA back then, and I said, what is the what if the possibility of one of the members kind of uh, withdraw from it or sort of don't respect yeah. the, 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 the right. spirit of the agreement. What I'd like to get yeah. your input, John, is about the ongoing tensions now between Israel and Iran. And this specifically pertains to the nuclear aspect. Mm -hmm. Do you foresee, in your opinion, as, a, as an analyst, because you have the analytical thinking, do you foresee that Iran will move into that direction of you know what? The gloves are off. We're gonna go ahead. For, we're gonna move forward with the nuclear device. Boy, that's a tough one. And I, th I think, well, in my heart, I think no, because there's mm -hmm. no upside for Iran. It will open Iran to any number of attacks and uh, and lifelong sanctions. Mm -hmm. um, but then on the other side, it's probably something that that the United States and the West ought to prepare for. Now, again, the JCPOA was a good idea. The JCPOA worked. And, and I'll add, too, that, mm -hmm. that the, the monitoring mechanism 
that was called for in the JCPOA was exactly the same monitoring mechanism that the United Nations used in Iraq. The same lead seals, the same surveillance cameras, the same inspection regime. Um, and it was working. It was working for, for the two or three years that it was actually in place. We decided to walk away from that. Um, and that's a shame. Now, now, where we ended up burning ourselves, hmm. U.S. law says that we have to impose sanctions on any country that does business with Iran. Well, hmm. as JCPOA, everybody was doing business with Iran, in including the British, the French, the Germans, the Japanese, everybody. And so just because Donald Trump decided that we were going to pull out of the JCPOA doesn't necessarily mean in our allies thinking that now they should pull out of the JCPOA as well or risk being punished. And so the, the French were the first to say to us, look, if you want to pull out, go ahead and pull out. But we're not pulling out. We're signatory yeah. to this agreement too. And if you want to sanction us, then go ahead and sanction us. And of course we haven't. Yeah. So, you know, in the first year or so of the Biden administration, it seemed like there was enough of a desire on the part of the U.S. government to um, to want to re-enter the JCPOA, and so we engaged the Iranians in talks. Those talks went very poorly. Uh, not much was was agreed upon, and mm -hmm. in the end, both sides just uh, gave up. It was a bilateral decision. We just gave up. So relations are are not good. Now, with that yeah. said, I, I think we underestimate the Iranians' intelligence in that. I think that they've concluded that they don't really need a nuclear weapons program. It would be too much of a risk for them. And uh, and it would be incredibly expensive. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think that if they really wanted to have a nuclear weapon, they would have it by now. They could have they could have certainly purchased the, the technology from the North Koreans or from the uh, or from the Pakistanis. And they haven't done that. Very, very interesting. And now with the dynamics that's taking place between Iran and Israel. And as one, you spend a lot of time in the Middle East. That's my fact. Yeah. You spend a lot of time in Iran. Many years. So yeah, yeah you, so you are uh, you are very familiar of how uh, the geopolitical landscape in that part of the world, even back then. And now I'm sure you are witnessing the shift. Mm -hmm. And this shift that is taking place in light of what Israel did by attacking the Iran's uh, uh, consulate in Damascus and by Iran retaliating. Do you foresee an open war? Because a lot of people are wondering, are we going to be seeing an open war between those two, which means will involve other players? No, I don't think so. And I'll tell you why. Um, first of all, I was stunned by mm -hmm. the Israeli government's very disingenuous statement yesterday that it never occurred to them that the, that the rest of the world would consider an attack on the Iranian consulate as a provocation. <laughs> like yeah. what, what what planet do you live on oh, if wow. if a violation a military violation of the Vienna Convention is not seen as a provocation so that was that was for domestic consumption um, mm -hmm. it, it, we should just ignore it but you know I, I have to compliment the Iranians on on the the great restraint that they have shown uh, really since last October certainly they are arming the Houthis, they're uh, mm -hmm. funding and probably arming Hamas, they're arming mm -hmm. and financing Hezbollah in uh, in Lebanon. In Lebanon. Uh, but the Israelis have tried repeatedly to pull the Iranians into this war because they know that if the Iranians go to war with Israel, the United States will have to go to war on Israel's side. Mm -hmm. And the Iranians just have not taken the bait. Now, God mm -hmm. knows they've faced these provocations. Uh, but look at the Iranian response uh, last weekend. Uh, it, you launch drones and ballistic missiles that take four hours to reach Israel, knowing that they have the Iron Dome, knowing that the U.S. has Patriot missiles uh, in the uh, in the uh, region, knowing that the Jordanians are also watching the skies. They knew they weren't going to hit anything. But yeah. the point was that they that they responded and they didn't respond hard enough to make the Israelis really do something terrible. I think it was mm -hmm. a very good decision on the part of the Iranian mm -hmm. government. Yeah. 
Semanos, we're saying that it was a slap in the face to Israel because Israel now yeah. is is it not uh, as of today, no decision has been made within the war cabinet in 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 Tel Aviv whether to retaliate or not. That's right. Go, I'd like to go back to your point about the U.S. getting involved with uh, uh, hypothetically, and we go with the hypothetical here. Mm -hmm. Should this go forward with an open war, what do you think Russia and China will do vis-a-vis? Uh, supporting Iran. Will they move forward with that or not? That's a that's a very good question. You know, just uh, last week, um, and I don't even remember now who it was. It, it may have been mm -hmm. the Polish the Polish president suggested almost offhandedly that maybe the Chinese would be interested in mediating. And then within 48 hours, the Chinese were offering to mediate. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one thing about China, I, I, I I'm not I'm not a fan of the Chinese government, of course, but yeah. uh, but the Chinese do not, with with very specific exceptions, the Chinese do not have a history of um, imperialism. You know, they, they took Tibet, absolutely. They took it. They've held it ever since. They have fought border wars with the Indians. They have mm -hmm. fought border wars with the Vietnamese. But But they don't go around the world invading other countries or attacking under other countries. It's just yeah. not something that's a part of their foreign policy. So I can't, I can't see the Chinese being becoming directly involved in a Middle East conflict. I do believe that the Chinese will offer to mediate. The Russians, absent a conflict in Ukraine, um, would have to come in on the side of the Palestinians, not militarily necessarily. Yeah. Yeah. But I think with with weapons and with um, and with assistance and materiel and ammunition and and things like that. Although, you know, you're talking about a lot of nuclear uh, nuclear countries here. And I I just like to I just like to believe that that cooler heads in a situation like that would prevail. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but at the same time, the West is preventing anything from moving forward. Yes. Uh, if I just uh, can uh, uh, mention, when China wanted to offer to mediate between Russia and Ukraine, what did we do? Yeah. We stepped forward and kind of shut the door on that nope. because yep. we saw the success that China achieved when it comes down to uh, establishing diplomatic ties between Iran, Iran and, and Saudi Arabia. Arabia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to our enemies. So. Uh, I do see the possibility of something like this, but the West is going to, I think the statement by the Polish president was nothing but uh, for domestic consumptions also, yeah. because they don't want to see uh, the Ukrainian conflict resolved, which by the way, you and I know, there is no way out but negotiation. Yes. And I'd yes. like to have you, I'd like you know, to that, have your input on that. that. That's a point that I try to make as often as possible. And I, and I, I say it frequently in, in my writing. Mm -hmm. One thing that the United States has been bad at in the last 20 years mm -hmm. is allowing the diplomats to do their job. I, I remember when I was still at the CIA, we complained all the time about the, the George W. Bush administration because I had never seen an administration work so hard to not talk to our enemies as the as the George W. Bush administration. Going back, going back to, well, I was going to say the Nixon administration, but you could go yeah. all the way back to the end of the Second World War mm -hmm. and engagement with the Soviet Union, for example, and then beginning with, with uh, Nixon, engagement with both the Soviet Union and China was, was a mainstay of American foreign policy. George W. Bush made a decision to not engage with our enemies, and that's mm -hmm. become policy for both of the major political parties here in the United States. That's a, that's a, a mistake. And, wow. you know, we, we used to say, we used to say that here in the United States, our own partisan differences ended at the shore, right? And overseas, we were always unified. Well, you know what? Now we're unified again, but in the wrong way, in, in a bad way. We're unified in that we have this foreign policy where mm -hmm. we try not to engage with the governments of countries with which we disagree. And I think yeah. that's just a terrible mistake. I, I'll add one other thing too, if you don't mind. Sure. I had, I had occasion to um, to speak with the Russian ambassador to uh, the United States several months ago. I had written a column that he had read and one of his aides reached out and he invited me to lunch. The, the ambassador invited me to lunch. And so he said, 
he wanted to know one thing, even in this time of war, is there any way that the United States and Russia can cooperate on something? And I said, oh, yes. And I've been consistent with this. I said, look, Afghanistan produces 93% of the world's heroin. Almost all of that heroin goes to Russia and Iran. And Russia and Iran have the highest rates of opioid addiction in the world. Five times the rate of opioid addiction that we have here in the United States. So we can absolutely cooperate on counter uh, narcotics, which we don't do. Um, we are just as worried as the Russians are about uh, the prospect of terrorist groups or rogue nations acquiring fissile material. So we should be and could be cooperating on counter proliferation. And Russia has been the victim of terrorism, just like the United States has been a victim of terrorism. And so we should be cooperating on counterterrorism. There was a piece in the Washington Post just today saying that Tajikistan, as small as it is, and as small a population as it has, provides more fighters to ISIS on a per capita basis than any other country in the world. Mm. We should be cooperating with the Russians on that, to stop mm. that. And, and you do that by, by encouraging economic development and education. But very, very we're not working with them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let me go back to the Middle East, because again, there's a lot, of, anything can happen on a global stage. If the Middle East is involved, you know how it is. It's oh, going to like suck in all oh, the energy. Mm -hmm. from, uh, uh, what I wanted to get your input on is the role of the Arab and Muslim countries, hypothetically, yeah. should an open war escalate. What do you anticipate? What do you see? Because I see now Jordan is already Egypt. I can't trust them. The Turks are playing both sides. I look at Turks with the issue of Cyprus and, and Greek. You know that, that story. Then so Saudis and United Arab Emirates, you know, they're giving a lip service to Americans, but they don't win their thing behind the scenes. Where do you see the role of the Muslim world that is uh, wishy-washy as far as what it uh, stands on? That's a good way of putting it. Um, and I would have to agree with you. I think it's largely wishy-washy. Uh, you, you know, looking at these countries independently mm -hmm. of one another, mm -hmm. the Saudis, regardless of their new relations with the Iranians, the Saudis hate the Iranians and they fear them. The Bahrainis fear them and hate them even more than the Saudis do. The Kuwaitis want to just be left alone. The Emiratis prefer strong business ties to, to Israel, but they're willing to take a step back over the course of this, uh, this conflict. The Qataris are pro-Hamas, period. They always have mm -hmm. been. Um, the Omanis are the diplomats of the peninsula. So they want everybody just to get along. Uh, but then you look at the Egyptians, the Turks, uh, you know, some of these other countries, the Jordanians, as you pointed out, the Jordanians, you know, are are in the world, um, are, are in the, the wrong neighborhood is what I meant to say. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> they, they, they worry about the Israelis because they share such yeah. a long border with Israel. But at the same time, fully 50 percent of Jordan's population is Palestinian. Palestinian. And so they have to stand up for the Palestinians. Palestinian rights and Palestinian human rights. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the Syrians, it goes without saying, uh, are are constantly uh, wronged uh, wronged by the Israelis. So, um, you know, it comes down to the Egyptians. And and what have the Egyptians done since October seventh? The Egyptians have done really nothing to help nothing. the Palestinians. They've sealed the border because what's what's the thing that the Egyptians want the least? They want an open border where Palestinians are going to stream across it and have to be placed in refugee camps uh, in Sinai. That's happened before. They don't want it to happen again. Okay. So okay. I think that the bottom line here, David, yeah. is that all of these Arab countries are taking this, this unfortunate wait and see attitude, mm -hmm. thinking, um, what position can I take that is going to cause the least amount of damage to my own country? And then their thoughts of the Palestinians are secondary to that. Very, very interesting. Let's shift to, and I know given the timing and I'm keeping an eye on it, uh, let's shift to Ukraine-Russia conflict. And the reason I wanted to uh, tackle this before we go to Far East in Asia, we'll close up with that. So uh, for the Ukraine-Russia conflict, what do you anticipate more, uh, coming forward, given the statements last week by the Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, saying that 
Well, of course, we're going to admit uh, Ukraine to NATO, which was a crazy statement anyway. I don't even know why he said that. Uh, uh, what I wanted to get your input, John, on is the idea that Russia is moving forward with some plan. Yeah. Are we seeing Russia taking over Kiev anytime soon? I don't think so. Um, you know, the Russians, the Russians from, from very shortly after the start of the war, uh, have been suggesting uh, uh, peace talks, right? That would mm -hmm. that would be brokered either by the Chinese or by the Turks. Um, the United States and Ukraine have rejected that from the very beginning. Now, the conventional wisdom is that the Ukrainians just cannot maintain this pace of war. They just can't. They can't hold mm -hmm. the territory that they reclaimed from the Russians. The Russians are moving back in. Good weather is upon us, and that makes it easier for the Russians to move West. The bigger problem is that the Republican Party here in the United States has turned on Ukraine. Whether it's for ideological reasons or for economic reasons, the Republicans just don't want to fund this thing anymore. Now, on Saturday, the House of Representatives is going to vote to provide another $61 billion in aid to Ukraine. Half of that is going to, um, is going to be in the form of a loan. Uh, a loan that would be forgiven after the election. So, um, how much longer are we gonna are we gonna end up uh, doing that? I think that there's really no national there's no national desire anymore here in the United States to keep funding this this war and providing materiel for this war. And at the same time, Russia is so much bigger and so much stronger than Ukraine. The Ukrainians just don't have the population to keep this thing yeah. going. Uh, forever. Wow. Yeah. And I think Ukrainians just did uh, uh, cross to one of the red lines now by attacking, uh, I think, in a, a radar system that deals with the nuclear weapons for yeah. Russia, yeah. which is a red line for, I wonder how uh, the Russian president is going to respond to this, but, but it would be interesting to see. Yeah. Now, if we are to think about this, will Europe ever take a, a stand as far as pushing back against the U.S.? As far as, you know, we're done with this. Let's sit down with the Russians and yeah. negotiate a settlement. Do you see the Europeans taking an initiative like this? Not under a Democratic president. No. Now, if uh, Donald Trump becomes president again, mm -hmm. he's expressed such anti-NATO sentiment that I think the Europeans would want to take leadership of, of NATO. So long as there's a Democrat in the White House or a Republican who's not named Donald Trump, um, mm. then I think I think that NATO is going to continue to look to the United States for leadership and for the bulk of the NATO budget. Uh, at the same time, you know, you've got to ask yourself if if NATO is really still necessary. Yeah, I, I'm I personally believe that it's that it's not. You, you know, I, I learned something interesting the other day. Um, what is the only time in the history of NATO, starting in 1948 to the present, where NATO was called upon to defend another NATO country from attack? Do you know? It, no, was, I, it was September 11th. 11th. Yeah, that was they, it. That was it. Yeah. And NATO came to our defense. Now, unfortunately, that meant going to Afghanistan to Afghanistan. occupy Afghanistan. But... Yeah. Um, but that's the only time. And, you know, and another thing, too, is it really worth the effort and the money? We have promised the Russians repeatedly over the course of the last four presidents that we would not continue to expand NATO to Russia's borders. And then we've broken that promise repeatedly. Yeah. Look at Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, uh, Poland. Uh, you know, yeah. it, we just keep doing it over and over and over again. And. We, we give the Russians no reason to uh, to trust us. Trust us, yeah. Yeah, we lost credibility. I mean, I've, I've been saying this even during my time in Washington that uh, I was in the thick of it in a sense of what are we doing here? And sometimes, you know, you'll have a conversation with the boss that the boss will invite you for dinner just right. to pick your brain on stuff. And I say, sir, that's where this is going is not going to bode well for U.S. interests in the long term. And of course... You know, you get the bureaucracy over there and all that stuff. So uh, let me shift to just for my viewers, guys, uh, for just prepare a question or two. 
uh, for John later on before before I, I let him go here. So may I may I uh, anticipate a question or preempt a question? Sure, sure. Let me, if and I for, see one here, for, for, uh, forgive we, me if if this is embarrassing to you, but I feel compelled to say something because I'm I'm glancing at the chat. Yeah, Folks. let me see because I wasn't looking at it at all. Let Folks, I'll see a question it, here. Yeah, go ahead, John. If you think that I am still in the CIA after I blew the whistle on the CIA's torture program, lost my pension, lost my job, lost my family, lost my freedom for two years, and you think I'm still in the CIA, that is the epitome of intellectual laziness. Sorry. Yeah. There it no, is. You're right. I didn't see that one. And I, guys, <laughs> I know I, uh, well, I do have a, I, I do have the community here, John, be a very, very respectful, very intellectual. Sometimes I'll get to those trolls and so forth. And uh, so you know, I'm glad you said something. So I didn't see it. And I will check out all this later on after I'm done. So let's talk about the, uh, uh, let's talk about uh, uh, Far East, China. Yeah. And the reason I want to get your input on this, because it just came to my attention this morning, believe it or not, that the Philippines and the U.S. Yes. Is, is going to be conducting naval drills. Yeah. But not, not, this is the key, not on the Filipino waters. Yes. So. This is crazy, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, what does it mean, John? How, how do you, how do you explain this? You know, it's this, it's this unnecessarily provocative pivot to Asia that, that started with Barack Obama. Um, listen, we, we have a very, very long relationship with the Filipino government. It's had its ups and downs. We mm -hmm. used to have the biggest Air Force base in the world there, uh, uh, Clark Air Force Base. We used to have the biggest naval base in the world there, Subic Bay. We don't anymore. But now uh, we have... Um, We've moved much more closely toward the, the Filipinos and vice versa in the last uh, 10 years uh, or so. Mm -hmm. And then just last week, we had the Japanese prime minister here in Washington for a state dinner. And the very next day, uh, the the president of uh, the Philippines, Bang Bang Marcos, he came as well for this trilateral meeting. The meeting was all about confronting China. The whole thing was about confronting mm -hmm. China, not about protecting the Philippines, not about protecting Japan, but about being proactively provocative against the uh, the Chinese. One of the things that I think many American policymakers forget mm -hmm. is that it was the Chinese who were attacked by the Japanese and and the 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 viciousness, of that attack, which lasted from the 1930s into the middle of the 1940s. It's a part of the Chinese DNA. You know, Chinese yeah. children are taught about the, the viciousness of the, the Japanese occupation. It's the Chinese that are more worried about what the Japanese might do to them than the reverse. And so why we've decided to confront the Chinese like this in the South China Sea of all places or in the yeah. Straits of Taiwan or or on a on an island that's only 6 miles off the coast of of mainland China by by yeah. putting 1000 US troops I just don't get what the end game yeah. is yeah. well I still think in the idea that some in Washington still looking at Philippines as a colony for us you know doesn't matter sovereignty or not it's just on a paper there is a say, there is another point that I was aware of and this has to do with the current president uh, Marcos Jr Bongbong uh, his father's assets that have been sort of blocked in the U.S. Could it, this be a part of that? Because I was aware of uh, what Ferdinand, Ferdinand Marcos Sr. assets were at that time. Oh, yeah. They were blocked. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This you and I are of a certain age. Oh, I, exactly. I mean, in terms of, of foreign uh, policy, I, I was a senior in college when Ferdinand Marcos was overthrown in the mm -hmm. people power movement. It was very, very powerful. And mm -hmm. um, and you're right. That whole family was under sanctions. I remember that uh, Imelda had something like, what was it, 10,000, 20,000 pairs of shoes. Sh shoes. Crazy yeah. thing, you know, yeah. while, while people were living in poverty and squalor in, in her country. How in the world that family came back? I have yeah. no idea, but I think you're right, David. I I think that at least the family's assets are are 
frozen yeah. or have been confiscated and turned back over to the Filipino people, I would assume. Yeah. Yeah, but it's just my concern with the uh, uh, Russian up tensions in that part of the world, especially when you consider that NATO wanted to open an office in Tokyo. Yeah. And you right. kind of start to wonder, why are we going yeah. to the Far East to create more tensions over there? What for? Yeah. And in fact, in fact, we gave Japan um, uh, major non-NATO status. That, that's an actual status with capital letters, major non-NATO ally wow. status. Uh, Saudi Arabia is a major non-NATO ally. Bahrain is a non, uh, major non-NATO ally. My guess is the Philippines is going to get it right soon. Oh, what does it mean? Like, well, do they have now access to... Yeah, they have access, access to, to some weapons and weapon systems that they otherwise wouldn't have access to. For example, the UAE, Australia, uh, Saudi Arabia, they have access to the F-35. So we'll give the F-35 hmm. to the Japanese as well. And and we don't for other countries. In fact, Turkey is a member of NATO, and we won't give them the F thirty five. Wow! Yeah. Wow. Well, that explains it now. Why Japan went ahead and increased its defense yeah. budget for twenty twenty four? Oh yeah, yeah, because because we order yeah. them to. You yeah. know, the, the the guideline for NATO is that you have to spend at least two percent of your 2%. GDP on yeah. uh, on a military budget, and something like three or four countries um spend that much money on on or three or four nato countries spend that much money on uh on their defense budgets but yeah. we're demanding it and we're we're forcing them to spend more money it's it's very dangerous very very interesting i want to take one last uh, topic with you briefly here and this has to do with turkey and greece or cyprus yeah. Yeah. Uh, is something you are very 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 familiar with uh, given your background, given also part of your professional career being spent in that part of the world. So why, why, what do you think of Turkey? Uh, sort of, uh, will, it be, will there be a war or a conflict? I won't use the term war between Greece and, and, and Turkey. Will you Turkey know, agitate that country? I, I gave an interview to a Greek newspaper uh, a few days ago, and they asked huh? me exactly, exactly the same question. And I think, no. I, I think there's no chance of a, of a conflict. There's there's very disturbing rhetoric going back and forth. I'll, I'll say that. And, you know, when the Turkish defense minister says that Turkey has a plan to take all of Greece's Aegean islands in 48, 48 hours, or that Turkey yeah. has a strategic plan to launch ballistic missiles on Athens, which, of course, is a population center, you have to take those kinds of threats seriously. But... The Turks always talk like that, and very rarely do they come close to actual shooting. The last time they came close to, to the actual exchange of gunfire was during the Clinton administration, and it was mm. over an, an islet called Emia, which doesn't even have people on it. It has only a herd of goats, and at the, wow. it's a Greek island, but the Turks put the Turkish flag, then the Greek uh, Coast Guard went, and they took it down, they put a Greek flag, and you know, <laughs> then their ships went and... Bill Clinton had to call both sides and tell them to cut it out. So I, I think a lot of this is is just rhetoric. Now, more importantly, mm -hmm. is vast amounts of natural gas have been found off the southeastern coast of Cyprus, stretching to Lebanon, um, Israel, and Palestine. And, um, and the Israelis, the Cypriots, the Greeks – and American oil companies have begun exploring, testing, and lifting some of that gas. The Turks fe feel cut out. And although mm. none of that gas, as has been discovered yet, is in Turkish territorial waters, I think probably a wise thing to do might be to share some of the wealth with the Turks and keep everybody happy. Uh -huh. As things stand right now, um, the Turks recently sent a, a battleship to confront a French uh, oil exploration ship. And wow. so there's there's very little going on in, in the way of, uh, of exploration right now. This is a problem also for the, for the Israelis and the Palestinians because much of that field is accessible yeah. from, from Gaza, from yeah. Palestine. And, you know, in the original agreement between all these different countries – there was an acknowledgement that that Palestine, and they use they use the word Palestine or Palestinians is what it is, that Palestinians yeah. 
own some of this gas, but that it would be up to the Israeli government to decide how much of the money the Palestinians get. And you know what the answer is going to be. It's going to be oh, zero. Yeah. 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 So we'll, right. we'll see. Yeah. It's, it's this very, is a tough one. Yeah. All right. Let me take, uh, guys, uh, because John is on limited time, he was kind enough just to carve out this time for us here. I'll have him back on the show. Don't worry. Uh, I'm going to take one question or two just to be respectful of his time. Uh, Army with Harmony, this is an avid supporter of the channel, John. So question, my understanding is that the Golan Height was hit and the Air Force base was damaged. Uh, when, Israel, when Israel retaliates, uh, will Iran continue to generally target military assets only? That's, that's a very good question. I saw the same reports that, that it was Golan that was hit. And I also saw a report that one rocket got through and and hit the edge of an Israeli base north of Elat. So, you know, this this again goes to goes to the um goes to the very patient policy of the Iranian government on this thing. I mean, they could have they could have targeted Tel Aviv, you know, and and civilian yeah. population centers like the Israelis have, frankly. Yeah. And, and they didn't do that. And so my guess is that if there is going to be more Iranian targeting, it's going to be of Israeli military facilities. I think yeah. that's actually a wise yeah. policy. And, and you want to know my my uh, my my thoughts about it? I'd, why, I'd love to hear why, that. Yeah. Why Iran didn't is because when Bill Burns, CIA director, went to Oman, that's when he asked directly yes. the Iranians yes. just to do something, but avoid the civilians. That's why the Iranians, I think, that, but no, there will be no next time. There will be no next time for Iran. Mike my word on it, guys. If I Israel right. conducts some crazy stuff, Iran's going to upstage the game by using its advanced missiles, and we all know what it means. So uh, I want to say thank you here to Francis Tango. Thank you for your super sticker. Thank and you. he's saying thank you to you, John, also for the information. Thanks very much. They're very, I have a wonderful uh, a group here uh, that they share the information intelligently and uh, respectful. And, and uh, timeline, Dunkley, one last question here. Uh, uh, to Dr. O, do you hear anything about China making the energy force feel chill? Do you know anything about that, John? No, that's the no, first I've heard of it. That's the first time I heard of it, too. I, I need to look into this. Like, a, like an Iron Dome idea? Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm going to look into this and check it out because I do know uh, China is working on something very, very highly advanced, uh, but it's not here. It's on the surface of the moon that I'm aware of, but I'll, I'll check on this one here. Well, John, I can't thank you enough for really, really, really your time. Thank Where can so my too. viewers find you and find your work and so forth? Uh, thank you. I publish everything I do on Substack. It's at John Kiriakou. And I'm also on Twitter at John Kiriakou. Okay. I'm going to post those for you guys on the description. Just check it out there. I do uh, follow John on, on Twitter. Just go ahead and follow him on Twitter as well and thank read you. up his article on the Substack. So once again, thank you so much, John. Truly appreciate you. And thank I look you. forward to next time. I'm looking forward to it. All right. All right, guys. I hope you find this very informative. I know John is on, was on limited time because he has other stuff. It was just kind, as I said, kind enough to carve out this time for us here for you to hear a different perspective. There is the reason why I also wanted to reach out to John because someone I trust, someone has been inside, understand the system, understand the global stage, knows how to read the geopolitical landscape. And I just want you to have the opportunity to listen to a different perspective. As always, remember, geopolitics impact your daily life in more ways than one. Till next time, guys. Bye-bye.